Well, I think we can go ahead and get started with introductions at least while uh, we'll give everyone else a few more minutes to sign in. Sure. And all this will be uh, you know, posted on YouTube for people to review in the future. Um, I'll trim out the, the first 50 minutes where we've been chatting. But um, to get started, my name is Brian Olegas. Uh, I'm a project architect here at SHP. Uh, we're right off 3rd Street in downtown. Um, I also have my NCARB certificate, and I'm one of the few um, NCARB licensing advisors in the area, which that just means I have a bit of a direct line to NCARB, and there's a bit of a, a form that some discussions can happen. If there's any issues that you might run into in your licensing path, let me know, and I can reach out to a larger group to kind of get a discussion going on how to resolve an issue. Um, we've got some other important references listed here. We'll share the slide deck as well. Uh, and these are just kind of some of the basic stuff provided by NCARB and then uh, some resources that we provide as AIA Cincinnati. A lot of the content that's in this slide deck is coming straight from NCARB from these sorts of resources. Uh, and so we're not, we're not doing a lot to necessarily create our own, but we're here to have a discussion about it. Um, and Paul, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Uh, sorry, I didn't necessarily have you on the slide deck today for an introduction. I am uh, Paul Shirley with Pelican Studio. I have been on my own since 2016, tw uh, 2017, sorry. And um, I, before then, I was at a very several firms, uh, the longest of which uh, 19 years at GBBN, and kind of got my exposure to all types of architecture from small projects to large projects and um, all different roles and from designing to construction administration and uh, project management, all that fun stuff. Um, I started my trek to becoming registered and, and and completed it in 2014 is when I got my architectural license. So um, I'm one of the, the procrastinators that took it way, took the exam back up. It was ARE 3 and then ARE 4 and finished in ARE 4. Um, and now we're on ARE seven well <laughs> still still 5.0 but yeah um, but uh, along the way um uh, did some are workshop sessions and am a big supporter of anybody trying to get registered so that's my involvement and basically brian you run the show and i'll just be around to be the sidekick and Absolutely. Off for their color commentary. It's totally fine. Yeah. Uh, and is it, sorry if I'm pronouncing it wrong, but Layla, uh, yes. do you want to mind introducing yourself? Yeah. Hi. And kind I'm, of where you're at and your path. Sure. Yeah. I'm Layla Zanilovich, and um, I am um, sort of um, at, a, at a point where I have to decide whether I need to go ahead and, and do one more push for this or not, because it's been so long since I started. Um, I have um, have had several setbacks, including a civil war, because <laughs> I, I come from Bosnia, and so there was a big mess with that, and it, it just kind of derailed me for a while. Uh, then I also moved from South Carolina to Ohio, and in the process lost some of the um, when I was doing the IDP, they wouldn't accept my credits from South Carolina because I had, I guess, didn't know that I was supposed to uh, transfer stuff within six months or whatever it was. So it just kind of had several setbacks like that. And so um, on and off, I tried a few times to test. I didn't pass and I didn't really think that I studied the right way. So in the last maybe a year or so, I connected with some local um, friends and some other uh, ladies in the Chicago area, and we formed a study group. So I've been getting into it and, and kind of ramping myself up and getting some resources that I didn't even know were out there. 
So, you know, for these younger people, they, they have uh, knowledge that I don't have as far as like uh, where to get these materials and, and all of that. So I think I'm in a good position now to start testing again. Um, and in the meantime, I've, I've worked uh, in several locations in Cincinnati, including big firms like HDR or small firms uh, like Herald Group and others. And then I was at the University of Cincinnati for almost 12 years and didn't really need to get licensed there because I was in the planning department and I'm in a similar situation now where I'm at the, um, I work at Bright Pat and I don't need to be licensed, but it's just a personal thing that I, I would like to get done. So now is my, my crossroad. <laughs> like I need to do it for myself. So that's where I am. Yeah, absolutely understandable. And yet, you know, everyone studies in a different way. And so, yeah, it's a lot of what we're trying to do here today is, you know, give us a quick overview and, and open up some discussion and offer any resources that we have available. Right. So, all right, uh, we'll get into it. And what before we get into the new test, I did want to give a quick NCARB update uh, on a couple things. So one, <clears throat> NCARB released a newsletter that stating that they um, reprimanded a group of testers out of California. Um, there were about six uh, testers that were caught copying, distributing, and trying to cheat on the test. Uh, and so what NCARB does for that, they will not only, you know, you know, um, void any scores that you may have, uh, they will publicly reprimand you. They listed these names and the firms that these people worked for, and uh, it's, it's definitely a black stain on your record. So read the NCARB guidelines and what they require for, what they ask for not, distributing and cheating on the test and they take it seriously that was one of the big reasons why we went from are 4.0 to 5.0 was because there was a cheating scandal that caused them to have to restructure the entire test so they definitely mm -hmm. take it seriously um and then some other new resources that ncarb has available so i uh i unfortunately can't access this because i'm not considered an eligible tester anymore uh, but I talked to a couple of the project designers I work with to check on some of these things to make sure it's viable. Uh, if you go to your NCARB record, and now this is listed in the brand new NCARB guidelines that they just released last week. It's just an update. Uh, any of the links that you might have will go straight to the new version. Um, but if you go to your NCARB record and go to the exams tab and you scroll all the way to the bottom, there's going to be this bar for ARE resources. And there is a box for AIA contract docs. You'll have to click a couple, like three or four terms and conditions agreements saying you're not gonna copy it, distribute it, sell it, modify it in any way. But they will give you watermarked sample PDFs of all the contract documents uh, to be able to download and use for studying purposes. And so you can print those off, mark them up, take notes, however you like put them on an iPad, however you like to study with it, makes it very much easier to deal with because uh, at the beginning of the year, I think, ARA switched their contract resourcing to um, a website called Katina, and it is not user-friendly if you're not paying for the full contract. And so it made it very hard to study with. Um, I know I, for one, had reached out to NCARB about this a couple of times, so I don't know if they got a lot of feedback and which they're offering this now. So this can be really helpful in reviewing the contracts. This is, that's gonna be a big topic for today with the construction and evaluation test, uh, but you should have access to this on your NCARB record. That uh, is so, a great resource. Yeah, absolutely. And NCARB's been doing a lot lately to make it easier to access these resources with having their their own versions of practice exams per division uh, available to testers as well. It's, it's, and they, they recently released numbers um, and saying that, you know, I think 70% of people who have passed the exam in the past year or all the exams um, have used NCARB's practice exams that they offer. And that's all free. 
And so they've been doing a lot to make it, to not necessarily make the test easier, but provide more opportunities and more resources for people, which is fantastic. Um, so an overview for what we're gonna hit today, we're gonna do a general overview of the test, what's in it, um, the length of it, number of questions, all that. And then each of the main categories of this exam are pre-construction activities, construction observation, administrative procedures and protocols, and project closeout and evaluation. And we'll take a closer look at each of those categories and go through a few sample questions for each one. So going through the overview of it, this exam has 75 total questions, 68 of them are scored. And what that means is that uh, you have the seven pre-test items that they'll go through. And then on occasion, there might be a, a couple questions there that aren't actually scored. You'll never know that, but they're they're testing the, the question. <clears throat> uh, there's, as typical, two case studies. Um, and the number of case study questions is 12 to 16. So that just means it's going to be, you know, it could be six to eight questions per case study, likely. Your appointment time is three hours, or I'm sorry, the, the testing time is three hours, and then you have 30 minute optional break with a total appointment time of three hours and 40 minutes. And one thing we always like to note with the breaks is that you can take them at any point in time and you can use as little or as much as that 30 minutes as you'd like. You don't have to take one at all. But when you have seen any portion of a question, whether you just opened it, didn't even read it, and then hit that break button, or say you marked a question to come back to it later, if you go on your break after you've seen any of those questions, when you come back from your break, those questions will be locked uh, and you will not be able to access them again. So it's something to consider. Just be careful about when you take that break and make sure you go back in review any of the questions that you may have left unanswered. Um, the focus of this exam is to test a candidate's ability to protect the health, safety, and welfare by delivering professional services through project construction, translating construction documents and specifications to communicate, coordinating construction activities to meet design intent, and evaluating completed projects. And so with these four categories that I mentioned earlier, this is sort of the, the spread that you'll see on the exam. There's not a single exam that gets distributed to everyone. They have multiple versions. And so they this distribution can be a little adjustable. But what you can start to see from this is that section two, construction observation, and section three, administrative procedures and protocols, those are the bulk of this exam. Those, those can be, you know, up to, uh, it looks like 74% of this exam. So as you're studying, if you're struggling with any specific topics or anything, it's good to refer back to this to understand, you know, what do you really need to spend more time on to really get a better grasp of as you're studying. NCARB also provides this whole matrix uh, in their guidelines that is a great reference to understand what they're pulling, pulling their questions from and the source material for those questions. And so you'll, what we'll see today, we'll, we'll often refer, reference back to what um, content the question was built from. And NCARB's questions quite literally are taken straight, taken straight from these resources. Uh, and so for the orange column there with CE, um, it hits, a lot of contract documents and a lot of the typical stuff with architectural graphic standards, building code, building codes illustrated, uh, building construction illustrated. Those are some big topics. The Architects Handbook of Professional Practice, you'll see has a little star in the corner there. And that is this lovely thick book. And most, most firms will have this um, that you can likely have as a resource, I think. Um, we will show some links to where you, uh, other resources on where you can get them. And I think AIA Cincinnati's office has a copy as well. But that little star next to it means that it's particularly important for this exam. And a lot of the questions will be pulled directly from it. 
Um, let's see, some more resources for this exam is, again, the building code. Um, there's great online resources for the building code. We reference ICC SAFE here. I know I personally use, um, well, yeah, yeah, I use ICC SAFE and then there's uh, opcodes, I think is another one. And then the CSI manual practice is another massive resource for uh, construction and evaluation. But what we note here is you you don't truly need that full manual. Don't don't go out and buy that. That's a very thick thick book with way too much information for what you need for the exams. Um, I think the I'll come I'll come back to that. I wanted this is what I wanted to jump to. So this is the the CSI master format divisions, um, and there are. 40, 49 division slots, but not all of them are used. From an architectural perspective, um, you really need to know uh, divisions zero through 14. So that's gonna give you all your architecture product products. And then you see 21 through about 33 is usually how far I personally go on projects. That's that's all your, your MEP, your earthwork, your civil, structural, or I'm sorry, structural lives in the earlier divisions, but um, that's your your typical stuff. And as you get past 34, you'll get into some more specialty things. Um, but from what you need to know for these exams, it's it's really this list. Um, they're not going to ask you to know individual categories, but if you did want to look into it more to better understand what might live in a division. Uh, you can look up master formats table of contents and it will be an exhaustive list of say everything that lives under division five for metals and you can you can take a dive through that to understand kind of what might live in that category and that's really what they're going to want you to know for these exams is understanding what category something lives in um let's see if i can go back a little bit here so a couple more resources, AIA contracts that I mentioned at the beginning, those are gonna be huge on this exam. We're gonna to be touching on pretty much every one of them, except for the architect agreements that you'll see in the earlier uh, PA and, sorry, uh, PCM and PJM exams. But we'll hit all the specialty contracts for change orders, PRs, uh, substantial completion, Instruction to bidders, get all that today. And there's a few, the contractor contracts as well. Um, this is another resource that we have for, this is essentially a study guide for the Architects Handbook of Professional Practice. So good link to check out if uh, it'll give you a bit of guidance on how to get through the information that's in here, rather than just trying to read that whole book. Um, as we get into a little bit more specific about the case studies on this exam, so um, we like to review this uh, every time we do one of these just because the case studies are such a specialty portion of the exams. Um, we like to tell you to take a little bit of time, set, a, set aside some extra time for these case studies because what, they, what they'll do is they'll, they'll present you with an abundance of information. Uh, and you have to be able to not only understand what that information is, but understand how to navigate it and find the answers within the resources that you're given. But the actual questions might be a simple multiple choice question. It might be a little lengthier with a calculation that needs to go into play, but rest assured that all your answers are in the resources that are given to you it's more a practice of being able to navigate those efficiently. Um, and so we always suggest, you know, having, uh, allowing yourself some extended time to review this. Um, some of the common resources that are gonna be found in construction and evaluation specifically are these, the contract documents that we've referenced. You might have sets of architectural drawings to review, plans, sections, site plans, what have you. Um, might be construction schedules, 
field reports, and excerpts of specifications. Uh, this one might not hit on building code as much, but they'll often have um, building code references and excerpts as well. And one thing to note when you are using those resources in the case studies is that there are functions in the test software that can potentially help you. There's, there'll be a bookmarks tab on the side so you can quickly jump to sections um, that can help in the contracts and say building code such uh, very specifically. There's a search function. If, if you know there's a specific phrase or word that you're trying to find, use that search function. It can get you to where you need to go pretty quick. Um, and then, you know, getting used to using the number pad on your keyboard. Every testing center is going to give you a full-size keyboard. And so that, and everything's going to be in the testing software. You won't have an external calculator. Uh, so using that, being, being adept with that number pad can help you save a few seconds. And then common formulas are always going to be given to you as resources on every question in the test. We also like to mention the functionality uh, of dragging and rotating drag and drop items during the exam. Um, this is mentioned in the NCARB guidelines, but you can easily slip by it. And you may not see this as much in the C&E exam, but essentially if there's an item in an object bank that you're supposed to drag from the side onto the answer area of the question, you can right click on that object and enter in a degree number to get it to rotate. And that rotational number is going to be given to you in some way in the question or in a graphic. Uh, if you look at the very bottom of this, I think that shows a, a 10 degree theta on the corner of that little site plot. So that's where you would get that information to rotate that how you would need to do it. We mentioned time with the case studies, but it's really important to consider the time that you have for the entire exam. Uh, and so this is a, a quick review of this exam, the number of items, and how much time you have. So the CAE exam has 75 total timed questions for 180 minutes. Uh, if you take, set aside an hour of that for the two case studies, you know, that's only, um, you know, less than 20 questions, but give yourself 30 minutes per case study, gives you time to review those resources that they give you and have a good understanding of that question. Um, so that leaves us about 60, 61 normal questions to be answered in two hours. And that would be about two minutes per question is a good way to think about it. And so what some people recommend is that you set yourself benchmarks throughout your testing session so that you can understand when to pick up the pace or if you have a little bit more time to say go back and review that question that you marked that you weren't quite sure about um, so say if you started this exam at eight in the morning and by question 20 you would want to be there before 8 40 a.m uh at question 40 it would be 9 20. Question 55 at 9.50 a.m. and get started on your case studies at 10 a.m. to give yourself an hour for those. That being said, no one says that you have to do the case studies last. Uh, if you're concerned about those and you're worried you're gonna run out of time for the case studies, you could always start with those. But an important thing to note is that every question is scored the same. Uh, there's no reason why you should weigh a question that is gonna take you five minutes to answer heavier than a question that'll take you 10 seconds. That 10 second one, in fact, is gonna be far more valuable to you to get the answer quickly and move on. And in that note, don't, don't waste your time. If you're not sure on a question or, or the approach to it immediately, mark it and come back to it. Uh, there's no reason to spin your wheels if you're not sure uh, where, where you're going with it. Make sure you get the, the answers you're confident on. So moving into the topics of this exam, uh, we'll get into pre-construction activities. Uh, and Layla, I'm, I'm sorry that you're the only one with us here this morning. Uh, we might get someone jumping out late, but 
if you have any questions, please feel free to jump in, chime up, and uh, let me know your thoughts. All right, thanks. So as we get into pre-construction activities, uh, we're looking at construction planning and activities that occur prior to the start of construction. So this is likely after the design's finished uh, and we're putting the drawings out, but you've got the whole bidding process to go through. And so we got objective 1.1, is interpret the architect's roles and responsibilities during pre-construction based on delivery method. So understanding the key elements of bidding is an important aspect of pre-construction activities. This includes required bidding documents, procedures for distributing documents, the pre-bid meeting, qualification of bidders, selection of the contractor, applicable standards of the AIA documents, um, and the architect's responsibilities for each of these items. And a lot of this can be can differ depending on the project delivery method. Um, the project delivery methods are very clearly spelled out in the architect handbook of professional practice. And so that's a great reference to understand those uh, different routes to how a project might be handled. For objective 1.2, uh, we've got analyze criteria for selecting contractors. So you'll need to establish criteria for reviewing contractors bids including accuracy, completeness. And then based on these criteria, you'll need to evaluate the contractor's bids and compare qualifications to each other to appropriate, appropriately select a contractor. For objective 1.3, we've got analyze aspects of the contract or design to adjust project costs. And you must evaluate and prioritize opportunities to reduce the project cost, scope, quality, or schedule. This includes consideration of contractual implications of the changes, sustainability, and life cycle cost goals, and the impact on project design and overall budget. This is, you know, that's change orders, construction change directives, uh, and how to, you know, be able to react as things come up through the construction project. So we'll go ahead and jump right into a sample question kind of related to this section. And so the question here is, which of the following should the contractor submit to the owner through the architect during the pre-construction phase of a traditional design build, bid build project? Check the three that apply. So this is a multi-selection question. They'll always tell you uh, whether you need to check two, three, four, et cetera. And so as we're looking through these answers, you can start to, pick out some key words in the question and then start to maybe eliminate some of the answers that don't quite fit. So a few th key things that I'd pull out of this question is that this is the contractor submitting to the owner and that it is a design bid build project uh, for the project delivery method. So you've got certificates of required insurance, schedule of values, product submittals for long lead time items, application for first payment, list of proposed subcontractors, and lien releases from, from subcontractors. So a couple that I can eliminate here just because we know that it's in the pre-construction phase, uh, you're not gonna have an application for first payment yet. That's not gonna start until the construction starts. Um, you're not going to have re lien releases from subcontractors. That's a that's a closeout item for the for the end of the construction or for you know releasing that information and that liability from the subcontractors. Um, what's the third one we want? So I think. Sorry, can you all still hear me? I, I just got in. Yeah. Yeah. You're right, yeah, submittals. Submittals would be submitted to the architect, not to the owner. Right, so let's see what we have here. Oh, sorry, I went too far. No answers. Y'all can still see my screen fine, correct? Yes. Okay, I got an odd message saying I was signed out from Zoom, but clearly things are still working, so. Not sure what that's about. <laughs> what? What? I'm sorry. I can't hear. I can't see you. 
<laughs> you can take over, Paul. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, so um, that that third one to Lemay was exactly right. The the product submittals uh, aren't coming until after those uh, bidders are selected and they're submitting product products. So what the contractor is going to submit to the owner is going to be that certificate for required insurance, schedule of values, and the list of proposed subcontractors to be able to approve that prior to the the final bids coming in. So uh, you'll see down here we have that rationale uh, comes from that uh, CSI project resource manual, and we'll talk about all these items and um, breaks down that question a bit, kind of like what we, what we did. So looking at the second question, we've got the architect is completing the bid documents for a new mixed use building. The owner requests the architect to include in the specification several items that are not yet fully defined. Uh, and so what you need to do here is drag the labels from the left into the boxes adjacent to the item descriptions below to identify how each of the unknown items should be included in the bid specification. Uh, they'll give you the word bank here. You drag and drop these into the appropriate answers and you'll have, even though they only gave you three answers here in four boxes, you'll have multiples of these to be able to drag over. Um, so that's that's not too much of a concern. Um, and as we're looking at these different options here, so we've got an automated, ir autom automated irrigation system at vegetated roof areas in addition to tamper-proof hose bibs. And so we need to consider, is this an allowance, an alternate, or a unit price? Um, from my perspective, I would say this would be an alternate because we are looking at this system in addition to the hose bibs that are already there. So we're adding an additional item that is outside of the base bid. Um, now, cost to manage, excavate, and dispose of hazardous materials at the direction of the owner's environmental consultant. Layla, would you have an idea of where this might fall with an allowance, an alternate, or a unit price? Um, I would say it's an allowance. I think I would agree. One of, one of the big things to note here is that you're not necessarily um, offering additional scope that would usually call for an alternate. And there's unknown conditions that you're, you have to manage. And so an allowance would give you a a pot of money set aside to tackle this specific thing as those items become uncovered and clearer as you go. So I think that's absolutely right. Uh, as we look at earthwork materials, uh, including base course, fill, and drainage course as associated with utility installation. So we may not necessarily know the exact amount of these earthwork materials that we'll need, but this is very clear scope that we know we'll need in the project depending on the quantity. And so I think this is a perfect one for a unit price where a contractor would be able to price out, say, every square foot of base course, fill, drainage course, and other associated items, how much that costs per square foot. And so they can put a dollar item to that and uh, as you get through the project, they can calculate, okay, I put a thousand square feet of this work in, and then they can give a price to that. So that should be a great one for the unit price. That's going to be cubic yard, but. The... You're, you're right. You're very right. <laughs> um, and then we're looking at occupancy sensors in all conference rooms in lieu of standard wall switches. And so this would be another case where we, we would have the standard wall switches as your base bin, and we're either adding to that or, in this case, replacing it with an alternate product. So that would fit as an alternate. That's what we got here. And again, this one is 
referencing that CSI manual practice and um, their rationale is, is pretty much what, what we walked through ourselves. So that's a good, good I thing would, to- I would think that on the first one, that would kind of trip me up into maybe it would be an allowance. I think I think the wording on that first one could be a little bit better. Um, the reason I would consider it to be an allowance is, well, of course they were going to have hose bibs up there, but how often do you want to get up there and spray it down? So, you know, I'm, I don't know the price. I don't know what to put in. So I'm just going to throw a dart and say, put 20 grand on there as an allowance for this automated irrigation system. Right. I, I think the key word they're trying to pull out of this is in addition to. Yeah. Uh, where I think that was that was the phrasing that they were trying to use to to note that this is above and beyond what the base bid is. But I, I would absolutely agree. I think that could if that was worded just a slightly differently, I think that could very easily fall into an allowance condition. I brought that up Layla, just to make the point that Years of experience on this exam mean absolutely nothing. <laughs> it's, it's all about what's in the book and how to read and follow what's, what the book is trying to say. So um, that's just one of those tips that I'll offer is take all your experience and toss it out the window and throw in just what you've read out of the book. Keep yeah. it to what the words are asking or mentioning. Exactly. And it... It may feel like they're trying to trick you at times, but which uh, they are. Yeah, yeah. And but what what NCARB says is that you know a they might give you three answers that could work, but what you have to do is find the most right answer. It can be frustrating, um, but yeah, it, there is sometimes gray areas in some of these questions, uh, and so a lot of it lives in the wording of the question and interpreting the language that they use. All right, moving on to the, the next section of c and &E is construction observation. Uh, and so this is all your on-site review, field reports and such. So we've got this section addresses visiting the job site throughout the course of construction and the architect's roles and responsibilities while on site. <laughs> Another thing that NCARB and AIA will reinforce is uh, protecting the architect legally. Um, and so you understand what your responsibilities are and understand what you shouldn't take responsibility for. So this will touch on that a little bit. So evaluate the architect's role during construction activities. The, this objective assesses the architect's responsibilities to the owner during construction, site visits, and subsequent documentation, including site observations, action items for project team members. And you must recognize the contractor's responsibilities to the architect, including change orders, applications for payment, shop drawings, other submittals, and the appropriate level of detail required for the schedule of values based on project size, scope, phasing, requirements, and schedule. You must also know the difference between the architect's design intent and the contractor's means and methods. Finally, you must identify the appropriate limits and extent of the architect's authority and actions during construction. So some, some important phrases there is the, the architect's design intent and the con contractor's means and methods. Uh, sometimes people will throw their hands up and say, that's mean, means and methods for the contractor to figure out. It's another way of saying, that's not my job. Um, but in all seriousness, though, that is important to recognize because you don't want to take responsibility for something that you don't necessarily have control over. Um, some additional objectives here. Um, evaluate construction conformance with contract documents, codes, regulations, and sustainability requirements. So you'll need to be able to analyze the contractor's completed work against the project requirements and identify non-conforming construction on site. This may also require evaluating the impacts of unforeseen conditions and material substitutions against code, quality, and program requirements. You'll need to coordinate your evaluations of construction conformance with that 
of your consultants and the owner's consultants. So say you, you put out a set of construction documents, your design's done, hand it off to the contractor, they go build it. You'll, it will never be that simple. <laughs> um, there's you know site work, there's always unforeseen conditions that happen, or especially if you're in a res renovations, uh, you need to be able to react to those unforeseen conditions as they become uncovered and again, understand how that relates back to those original contract documents that they're working from. And if changes need to be made, you still have to keep in mind fire safety, life safety, and those code implications uh, as those changes are made throughout that construction project. Uh, and then the final objective here is determining the construction progress. The construction observation also requires the review of work in place against the contractor's construction schedule and schedule values and understanding the impact of delays along the critical path. Uh, so as, as an architect, you're often will be responsible for reviewing their progress and the contractors will give you a schedule of values to review um, before sending it to the owner as their proof of payment. Uh, so that's that's what they'll use to say, you know, I am 30% of the way through this project by this schedule of values. And they will then be asking the owner for up to the 30% of payment for the project. And so that's kind of how that all um, gets processed. So a question in this category, we've got during a routine site visit, the owner tells the architect to change the layout of two interior framed walls the contractor has already framed based on the construction documents. The framing changes will not have an impact on any code related issues. Uh, the owner is adamant the walls be reframed per the new request, which of the following should the architect do? So there's a change on site, um, we've already established that there's no fire safety, life safety, code issues, or access accessibility, potentially. Um, and the owner's ready for this change to happen. Uh, there's not much discussion to be had. Uh, so our options are ask the contractor to schedule a meeting on site with the owner, architect, and framing subcontractor to review these changes. Um, review the expected effect on construction cost and schedule with the contractor and prepare a change order for or owner review. Issue a construction change directive with a requirement for time and material invoices to be submitted for the work. And then include documentation of the discussion and a drawing of the revised framing in the field report of the site visit. So Layla, would you have any any thoughts here? Uh, anything right off the bat jump out? <laughs> um, it it takes some time to dissect some of these. Yes, yeah. There's a lot of information that they're throwing at you here. So I think one. I think we can eliminate the first one. Because that is, you know, setting up an on-site meeting to review everything, uh, and we're not even initiating the change at our point. At that point, it's just having a meeting. But the owner is already very clear that he wants these changes to be made, and they've already got that figured out. Mm -hmm. And I think that would also eliminate the final one, the include documentation of the discussion, because that's that's just taking meeting notes that, again, is not initiating this change in any way. Any thoughts between the, the other two? I, I personally tripped up on this one when I was putting the slide deck together. <laughs> well, the owner wants it done. So... Um, I'm leaning to number 
to the second one. So that's what I lean toward as well uh, with change order. It's the usual process for initiating a change uh, in a project to get cost and time reevaluated. But what they're asking for here is that you actually issue a construction change directive. Uh, and so what that is, is it's it works similarly to a change order in the sense that you are um, modifying the construction document, the contract documents to initiate a change. But the construction do change directive is an immediate order to move forward with the changes and saying, we'll figure out time and cost later after the work is done. Whereas a change order reverses that process where you're really, you're, you're drawing up the, the revision, the change, you're issuing it to the contractor to review for them to then give an estimate on cost and time uh, changes to the project. And then that would get sent to the owner for their approval. And no changes would actually happen until that change order is approved. But what this question is saying here is that, you know, this autumn, the owner was already on site. This discussion has already been made, been had. They are adamant that the walls be changed and there's no reason to go through that whole approval process. They're already on board. We'll figure out the time and cost later. So yeah, I know it was like, I, I was between the two and then I'm like, hmm, it might be the third one, but I think there's maybe tricking. So, right. Yeah. <laughs> and typically, you know, at, at least in, in my experience, construction change directive is not typical. Uh, it, it can put yourself in a vulnerable position of just saying, go do the work, we'll figure out the cost later. <laughs> um, it's a very, very privileged uh, thing to be able to do and not worry about the risk that you're putting yourself into. Uh, mm -hmm. Would you say the similar thing, Paul? I didn't work with clients that would issue change directives. I only worked with clients that would go on the change uh, order route. Like, right. let's slow it down. My right. last go around uh, was with a client that everything that they, any change that they said they wanted done, it was a change directive. And Interesting. that <laughs> threw me. It was just as you said, it was extremely uncomfortable. Um, I always kind of wondered, like, all right, they're going to go down this road and they're going to get, you know, dinged with something and, and they're going to, you know, nitpick back and forth and not not come to some resolution and there's going to be litigation out of this but right um, but that's the thing to keep in mind is that the change directive is the owner is telling you i don't want to go through this go ahead and do it and and that's a change directive is signed off by the owner as well as the architect mm -hmm. so the owner is as culpable in in a bad decision as as the architect is and we can advise but uh, ultimately it's the owner's decision yeah so it it was crazy <laughs> all right so we've got another question in this category for a bit of a construction observation on site so we've got looking at a, a new townhouse development the architect reviews the contractor's installation of the roof sheathing. And this is a, a point and click sort of question. So they're asking you to click on the material in the photo that would contribute to the required fire separation between adjacent townhouses. Uh, and so this is relying a little bit on some general code knowledge to understand that when you have these adjacent units, there has to be some sort of separation between it. And this this question should honestly be very quick. Uh, and what you're really just being required to do is identify the material that is creating that fire separation. So what we can see in this picture very clearly is the red tinted sheathing uh, right through here. And so with all this, so that's the chemical treatment on the wood sheathing that turns it red and that's gives it the fire protection and really anywhere in within this outline that we have 
you can click within that and that is considered a correct answer. And so the, the point and click kind of answers like this, they'll never be impossibly precise to click on uh, by any means, um, but you do have to make sure you get within that area appropriately. So yeah, this, this reference is to the International Residential Code saying to, in order to provide the appropriate separation uh, using fire retardant treated wood along with class C roof covering is an acceptable alternative to using a parapet. So in a firewall condition, the typical case prescribed by the code is to have um, a three foot parapet. I might be thinking commercially, I'm not as familiar with the IRC as I am the IPC, but. <laughs> the parapet's not required in the residential building code. Right, okay. They just want you to take it up to the underside of the membrane or to the outside of the building membrane, the veneer. Right, okay. All right, and getting into the next category, uh, we've got administrative procedures and protocols. So I think a lot of this is uh, sort of what's what's defined in contracts and specifications as responsibilities of different parties in the agreement. So this section is about the documentation necessary to the construction process. Clear written communication is an essential aspect of the construction process. So the first objective here is determine appropriate additional information to supplement contract documents. With an architect, you'll need to evaluate contractor requests for additional information and determine if a request unexpected if a request unexpected dis disruption or other situation requires a change in the contract construction contract you'll need to determine the appropriate documents for communicating requested information and design revisions due to a scope change schedule delay or unforeseen condition so i think uh an important, some important language here is that those those contract documents that you distribute to contractors are in fact a legal contract, and you need to be aware of as these requests for information and or disruptions come up on if changes need to be made to that contract, how that is appropriately done through this paperwork process. Um, I often tell people it's it's very easy to mark up an RFI or uh, even a, a submittal uh, and send it off. And that's very often the wrong way to initiate a change. Uh, you can, it, especially through a submittal, that you should never necessarily create design changes to the contract documents through a submittal. You you would be able to identify an issue through that and then you would need to go through a change order process appropriately um, you next objective is to evaluate those submittals including shop drawings samples mock-ups product data and test results uh, architects must assess the contractor's understanding of the project scope by reviewing the contractor's submittals against the contract documents they also must determine appropriate responses to the contractor and evaluate requests for substitutions. Our next objective is evaluate the contractor's applications for payment. So this is kind of what I've mentioned earlier. You're reviewing the contractor's application for payment against the completed work, uh, which is a critical portion of the construction process. This is done based on observations during construction site visits and a concurrent review of the contractor's scheduled values and approved change orders. You will also need to evaluate methods of retainage and their application throughout the project. And our final objective here is evaluate responses to non-conformance with contract documents. After non-conforming work is identified during site observations, you must be able to determine the source of the nonconformance, analyze the cost, schedule, and design implications, evaluate possible resolutions of the nonconformance, and communicate the selected solution to the team. These steps will need to be taken in coordination with your consultants and the owner's consultants. So things go wrong sometimes. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, 
and maybe something's what? not built. Yeah, right. Never. Maybe something's not built to the contract documents. And you have to be able to observe that, document it, and make a reasonable uh, suggestion on the solution, whether that, in the more extreme cases, it could be tell the contractor to rip it out and start over. And in some cases that's necessary. Maybe they are completely non-conforming with code requirements and it's a life safety issue. Absolutely, tear it out. Um, but, you know, it might not quite fit your design intent, but, you know, it works. And then it's, it's a discussion with the owner on like, is this important? Do we need to evaluate the cost? or the schedule impact of making this change, maybe something's going to wreck the schedule if you have to tear it out and do it again, and it's just frankly not worth it. So it, it's it's a discussion worth having a lot of the times on is, yes, it may be non-conforming to the contract documents, but do we need to change it? Uh, even if you don't make a change, it's still important to document this because with that non-conformance to the contract documents, you need to understand liability in that when you know with your design intent you had a certain action that when it's non-conforming you don't necessarily want to take responsibility for that if it could cause liability issues down the road i think another way to phrase that is when you're in the construction when you're in the design production mode you're acting as the owner's Right. Mm -hmm. And then when you're in the, uh, you're, you're acting as a direct relationship with the owner, you have the driver's seat and you're steering the owner and you're culpable for decisions made when you're doing the design drawings. Mm -hmm. When you're in the construction mode, your liability shifts, whereas the contractor's now in the driver's seat. You're merely a passenger on the bus and you're to si simply advise the owner. And if you do not advise, you're culpable. So if you advise and the owner and the contractor make a decision that's contrary to the way that you recommended it, that's on them. You've advised them. You've fulfilled your part of the contract mm -hmm. um, and the agreement. So to in, in another bring it even more into reality if you don't mind yeah um, a colleague of mine was talking to me about how he was so worried that he was going to get sued for this um his agreement during the construction side of it was just construction admin the contractor hired a surveyor to lay the building out and they built it and they're chipping the inside of it and somehow it came to light that the building is actually off three and a half feet in one direction five feet in the other direction <laughs> from from what the design documents say and so this architect friend of mine is like freaking out and i'm like you've got no culpability in this you didn't hire the surveyor your drawings were right, your survey was right, and the contract contractor who hired the surveyor to stake it out is the one that's culpable. And the surveyor that did it wrong is extremely culpable. Mm -hmm. So you've got you know, a little bit of breathing room in there and that you gotta keep those lanes, you gotta stay in your lane. Right. And you don't wanna over advise or you don't wanna over direct. Yeah, and you, Absolutely, you should never be on site trying to tell the mason how to lay his brick. That is, exactly. you, as soon as you do that, you're taking responsibility for it and you are culpable. And yeah, so it's just, I think stay in your lane is a great way to put it and understanding, understanding your responsibilities. All right, we'll get into a quick question here on this topic. So this, there's a little bit of math in this one. Um, so after construction has started, the contractor finds that the specified carpet has been discontinued. The budgeted cost was $17 a square yard, 
with a total of 3,500 square yards of carpet needed. Contractor, the carpet subcontractor suggests an alternate carpet, which is acceptable to the owner. It's $18 a square yard, but the price would drop to $15 a square yard with a larger 4,500 uh, square yard minimum. Due to the delay in finding the replacement carpet, the order must be expedited, which adds a one square yard premium. Using the most cost effective option, what will the cost difference be for the new carpet? So this is uh, just a few equations to run through with this. Let me, if I can't pull up my calculator here, we can look at this. So a few things to note here. I think we need to start with what is, what is the base cost that we're trying to compare against? Because what they're asking for is what is the cost difference, not what the final cost will be. So we'll need to start by taking that initial cost of we've got 17 times 3,500 square yards. And so that initial cost is $59,500 for carpet. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stack this up. Uh, and so, say with the new cost of if we just got what we needed at eighteen dollars a square yard and thirty five hundred square yards, um, but there's a one square yard premium, so we're going to do you know the eighteen plus one, so we got nineteen dollars a square yard, and we're going to do that by the thirty five hundred dollars. So. If we just got what we needed with the new carpet type, it would be 66,500. And if we then did looked at if we got way more than we needed, you know, sometimes it's not bad to have attic stock of um, this, but we get a lower cost because of the uh, minimum cost on it. So we're going to do 15 plus the premium again at 4,500 square yards. I, I did that wrong. Sorry. <laughs> You're fired. Yeah. So the cost actually comes out higher. Uh, granted, we're getting more carpet, but we're we're talking about using the most cost-effective option and what would be the difference. And so I think we can we can throw this one out just because it's a higher cost, and we're going to find the difference here. We've got sixty-six five hundred minus fifty-nine five hundred and our cost difference is seven thousand dollars so they essentially ran through the same process here uh that you can see in their step-by-step -step instructions so was that was that pretty clear layla yeah uh, you only have two minutes to do it <laughs> right and, and like i you know typed out a lot of those those are some pretty simple calculations at least there so you may be able to do a little bit of that in your head and and figuring that out and maybe not do step by step as they have it but but you make a great point uh that if you look at this and right off the bat realize like if you don't understand the path of this calculation immediately you're you're burning time uh and so this this one is a pretty simple example but in another case it might be a little bit more complex it might be a good one to flag and come back to uh if you feel like you have more time uh, later down the road. So it's a good note. The calculations definitely always take a little bit more time. So looking at the last objective project closeout and evaluation. In this section, you'll focus on post-construction activities. It's the smallest section of the division, but cover, covers several important aspects for the closeout and completion of a project. So our first objective here is apply procedural concepts to complete closeout activities. As an architect, you will need to be familiar with project closeout documents, which may include warranties, record drawings, a punch list, and a final application for payment submitted by the contractor. You will also need to review the contractor's completed work, make determinations regarding substantial completion and final completion of a project, understanding the implications of each of those processes. And then we need to evaluate the building design and performance. You'll need to assess the building's performance during its first year of use with tools such as user surveys, building commissioning, 
which may include sustainability rating systems. It's critical that you then determine a res response to identified building performance issues. I know uh, internally here at SHP, like we, um, not always, we certainly try though. We, we try to do an 11th month walkthrough with the contractor and the owner of just saying like, hey, your year of contractor warranty is almost up. Let's, let's do a walk, see if you're having any issues with the building here. Um, but as I mentioned too, it might be building uh, user surveys of people who have actually been using the building for a year or understanding that performance through what is actually a hired commissioning service that uh, is documenting and recording the efficiencies and effectiveness of the systems of the building. Brian, do you find that that's primarily with schools or is it all of yeah. the projects that you do that with? We, we, we try to do it more with the schools. I, I think, um, you know, they they have a lot going on uh, in a given year that it's good to schedule something way out in the future just because and and then they've got so many so many faculty that interact with that building that it one person may notice something that never actually gets communicated it, it's good for us to just sit down with the owner and we make that time for them to do a walk of the building and see if there's anything that's come up in that year, but Is I don't think you're finding Layla as well. Sorry, repeat the question. Have you, have you done more of these post evaluation walkthroughs or project closeouts where you assemble your drawings, the spec books, you give it to the owner um, at, at their request at the end of the project? Um, I was really the owner when I worked at UC, so it was a little bit different for us. So no, I haven't done that in the last probably 15 years, but before mm -hmm. that, yes. Okay. Yeah, I, what, an important thing to note from all this is that um, by the AIA contracts and everything is that um, there's essentially a one year warranty on everything in the building for the general contractor. And within that year, they're responsible for uh, any negligence or incorrectly installed or damages that may have been remaining or made themselves present in that year. Um, looking at one of these final questions that we have, I think we have eight total today. Um, the contractor notified the architect that the project was ready for substantial completion. The architect inspected the work and prepare the following list of incomplete work. Check in the box next to next next to the item in the punch list below that must be completed before the architect can issue the certificate of substantial completion. So the important thing here is understanding what is required of substantial completion and what that in a general sense what that is described as is is it the building move and ready and can it can everything in the building be used appropriately? Um, usually doesn't take into account aesthetics and maybe there's some comfort issues, but can the building be used appropriately and safely? Uh, so there's, it's looking for an item in this punch list that absolutely needs to be completed before the certificate of substantial completion can be released. So we've got the lobby, we've got some paint touch up, some damaged baseboard, uh, the wrong threshold material. A lot of that sounds like a little bit of aesthetics and, and touch up. We've got in apartment 103, got paint touch up, again, paint touch up and bathtub that doesn't drain properly. That could be an issue. Let's skim through the rest of these. We've got apartment 201 is again, paint touch up, replace a light bulb and a kitchen fixture. That one may, maybe that needs to be replaced for that kitchen. Um, apartment 202, we got paint touch up, replace an HVAC filter and a damaged grill. And then apartment 304, we've got paint touch up, a missing window screen, and a missing shelf bracket and a bedroom closet. 
So any thoughts on, you know, what needs to be fixed before the owner can appropriately and safely move in? So yeah, the, the bathtub maybe, but I'm also questioning the, the wrong threshold material. So wouldn't that trigger? Right, and I, I, think, I think an important note there is that they call it the wrong material. It's not necessarily the wrong threshold. Like, I, I assume you're thinking of it per, from the perspective of maybe it's a trip hazard or yeah, you know, it's yeah. an accessibility issue. Uh, I, I think there, I, I think it's a wording issue on their part, or it's just not clear enough because I think their point is that they're trying to just point at the material that it's an aesthetic thing. Okay. Um, I, I think the answer that they were looking for was the bathtub. Um, and, you know, I think this could have gone uh in the direction of maybe the light bulb replacement if it was the only light bulb in the room or maybe the hvac filter and damaged grill but again that's uh that that's probably leaning more toward uh comfort of the space and it's not necessarily an inhabitable condition uh, we have a a note over here that uh john put in for us Compiling a punch list often occurs around the time of issuing the certificate of substantial completion and when the project is at a point where the owner can move in and use the project as intended. There may be small amounts of work remaining by the contractor and future applications for payment forthcoming. So yeah, kind of what we reviewed there and the what they were looking for is that that plumbing fixture was not draining properly, which could pose a health hazard and it's not able to be used properly. I wonder if the missing window screen in the bedroom is an issue and that it's the fall hazard. The window was left open mm -hmm. and, and it didn't have the screen. That to me also seems like one of those life safety issues. The HVC filter and damaged grill, that's more like the warning on the wrong threshold. Uh, as long right. as the HVC system is working, they can come back and fix the damaged grill that is working properly. Right, right. So yeah, they'll they'll like like I mentioned earlier, they're looking for the the most right answer. Yeah. <laughs> and so like, there's there's certainly some gray areas in here. Like maybe maybe not, but when they're just looking for that single checkbox, um, and, and you know when. When you're on site and you're the one doing this punch list, you can say, I'm not releasing that substantial completion until you know that window screen is replaced because you have a concern for a life safety issue. Um, that is that is on you as the architect. Yeah. All right. So our next our last question here, we've got seven months after that substantial completion for a new office building. The building owner contacts the architect to report that mold has been found in a basement utility room. It appears a mechanical exhaust fan has malfunctioned. Which of the two should the architect do? Which of the following should the architect do? Check two. Um, so we've got submit an additional service request to the owner. Meet with the owner to review the building operations. Advise the owner to file a claim for damages, advise the owner to notify the original contractor about the issue, advise the owner to hire a new contractor to fix the fan, and specify a new fan for the owner to purchase as a replacement. So I think some of the important things to take from this question is the timing of when this is happening. So this is after substantial completion, but it is still within that first year. We're only seven months in. So it's still within that first year after that date. And so there's still responsibilities in play um, that people have for that first one year warranty. And so with that, I think you can knock out a few things. So one, there's no reason that owner should have to file a claim for damages because everything is still under that one year warranty. So I think we can get rid of that option there. Um, there. There's also no reason for the owner to hire a new contractor because the original contractor is the one that is responsible. 
Uh, so I think now that we have it narrowed down to four, we can look at what, what do we think that the architect should do? And I think, oh, uh, I'm sorry, let's knock out this first one as well. Because again, it's in that first year, it's part of your responsibilities as an architect to work with them on this issue that they're not requesting an additional service. So you shouldn't be necessarily charging more for this review of that warranty item. <clears throat> but so it's going to be probably going to be good to go ahead and meet with the owner and review things on site to then better determine what the approach might be. And then from there, we can, um, it, I think our other two options were specify a new fan. Again, it's a warranty item that it should be the responsibility of the contractor to replace and not necessarily provide a whole new product. Uh, and so we're probably going to go ahead and advise the owner to notify the original contractor and work with them on the issue. And so that's what we've got here. So it's meet with the owner to review and advise the owner to notify the original contractor. And as, as I mentioned coming into this, so this is all responsibilities that are outlined in the owner's contract with the architect and the owner's contract with the contractor. Uh, and so that's going to be your B101, your A201, and related contract language. Do you have any other notes here, Paul, with uh, things I happening in that year? Um, I mean, this, I mean, you, you've said everything that I would have pointed out. It's part of your contract. No reason to. Uh, throw in additional services it's you're there to be proactive and help the building owner complete the project mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, yeah it's you you really want to give everyone the opportunity to yeah do everything that they're supposed to i don't yeah. you don't necessarily approach the issue of you know let's let's start some litigation let's get some other people in here let's get these costs rising. <laughs> Even though that's maybe where some of us go, just because we know from personal experience again, sure. people are not responsive. Oh, I've been notice, not, uh, notifying this contractor for seven months and he hasn't come out yet. Okay, well then maybe that's a time to send them a, a notice and and then move on yeah. with a different contractor. But this question doesn't say anything adversarial about Right. Any agreement or party or anything like that. So you just have to take those thoughts and push them out and say, well, this is obviously the perfect project. It just had a malfunctioning fan. So, right. Right. And, you know, the, the contractor may still be responsible for, you know, remediating the mold issue and such, but uh, that's, we're not, we're not in that adversarial position yet. Uh, as you said, I think that's a good way to say it. All right, so that's all we've got for the construction and evaluation uh, test itself. But we wanted to touch on what resources AIA Cincinnati has and before you do that, what we offer. What's that? Before you do that, so yeah. uh, lay the of those three um, components. Do you do you have any opinions about uh, pre-construction, construction, and post-construction? Um, I haven't started studying for this section yet, so I'm, I was just kind of trying to get a, an overview and then hear, you know, your feedback on some of these and, and what, like what to focus more on. And, and then, and, um, obviously it's nice to have these charts where you see where the, the bulk of the, the questions will come from. So. Yeah, that's basically where I am. Yeah, Are you fine. more comfortable in any of those, um, like from the owner's side of the table, uh, being with you see, are any of those sections more familiar? Um, I would say uh, probably the administrative side. That would be okay. where I'm, I'm most comfortable at this point. Processing um, pay apps, going through the yeah. uh, 
yeah, the reviews and mm -hmm. yeah. So in looking at it in that way, when you're approaching this exam, section three is where you ought to spend a majority of your time because when you're answering those questions, you know those will be right. And through sections one and two and four, when you're going through and you're touching um, the the questions, um, you, you can ask yourself, is this a section one, section two, or section four, something that you're familiar with or not familiar with. And knowing that there's only five to 10 questions in section four, I don't really have to spend a lot of time focusing on I'm not familiar with it. I'm going to waste, you know, six minutes on this one question. Go back, mark that uh, as something to come back to later on. Um, make sure that you're staying focused and on on game. Your game is look for those questions or things that you are most familiar with. Mm -hmm. Hit those, hit those quickly, and then go back and tackle some of the other ones. But yeah, you know, that's that's the kind of what. How I would have taken the exam is completely different from how Brian did it and how you will do it. And we can't stress this enough. Mm -hmm. Know yourself, know your your strengths and weaknesses, and keep that strength in front of you at all times when when you're in that exam. Just because yeah. you'll get you'll get overwhelmed. The pressure and time um, eats away and makes you do stupid things. So. <laughs> Have you um have you messed around with NCARB's uh, demonstration exam or any of their press practice exams? Yeah, I did um, check that out, and um, I also through the study group um, found out about other resources out there like designer hacks and yeah. you know other testing things that that will help. So yeah, that's really good. Good, good. Yeah, I was just going to mention you know that NCARB's demo exam and um, their practice exams is quite literally the same software as the official exams. And so even if you're not really focusing on on answering the questions and taking the practice exam, just messing around with the little tools, understanding how to use the whiteboard, how to use that calculator on there, uh, how to use their strike through highlight tools and all that uh, are very useful. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things that I was going to mention with what we offer, and I mentioned that I was recording this video uh, on AIA Cincinnati's, well, we've got our web page, and then I, we've got a YouTube page as well that will put all this. And the first video that we did for this series was just an overall introduction to NCARB, the ARE, and everything. And we actually run through that demo exam if you have any questions about how to use any of their tools, um, and that that can be helpful as well. Okay. Um, so some other things that we've done here is that we went through that NCAR matrix that they have at the end of their guidelines, and we broke that down into figuring out where can you access these things? Can you get it for free? Can you get it from the library? Is it worth spending money on? And then also we have you know some of our own kind of opinions that we put together internally of you know how is this useful uh what is this good for or you know maybe what what exams does this resource focus on and so the this is straight out of the ncarb reference uh matrix but what we did we kind of gave them a priority list that they're ranked by and so some of the big things is those aia contract documents the handbook of professional practice uh, and then we've got, you know, there's other options for maybe we've got some of the, the ballast review books. I think we have a copy of this in the AIA Cincinnati office. You're welcome to check out. Um, there's a couple different, I know my office recently subscribed to Amber Books is another big study resource that you can use. Um, and so a lot of these things, they might be free and we've got, we have links to them or provided through NCARB. Or they might be one of the pricier items and we'll have, um, let's see, we've got, these are the PPI books. We do have a copy of this in the AIA Cincinnati office. Um, the Handbook of Professional Practice, you know, there's a good chance 
uh, firms will have that available for you, or you can get it from the Cincinnati I, I Public bought, Library. Yeah, I bought mine, so I have one. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then all, all these, so you can go through this if you ever have a question of where you can get something rather than immediately going to buy it. I know I have an old version of Building Construction Illustrator, not they're recommending the sixth edition, but the Cincinnati Library have the third edition. It's still a valuable resource uh, regardless of that edition. Uh, as we go further down the list, these may be referenced, but we haven't ranked them as a high, super high priority. They might be expensive for what they offer, uh, even if they are touched in some of the exams. And so, mm -hmm. worth That's reviewing. Chart. Yeah, mm -hmm. worth reviewing if if you are questioning on if you need a resource or not, and uh, see if we've got any feedback on it. Um, this is again, I think this is. If you go to, if you were under it, resources. Membership. Yeah, that's probably right. Early like professionals. The, early professionals under resources. We've got we've got a few important links here. So we've got this funding assistance that is worth reviewing, um, and then here's our ARE resources. So we've got links to a number of these things, um, and this spreadsheet included and some other things here so as a quick reference for that stuff and then ad additionally on a, on the second tab of this uh we also gave a little bit of review of those third-party resources so uh we've got designer hacks on here we've got black spectacles hyperfine uh, i think i we recently added amber books and so there's links to all these web pages and you know some of them i know designer hacks can just be quick hit quizzes to kind of keep you in the the mindset of testing and but they it might not be the same exam experience as like a practice exam whereas like black spectacles outside of ncarb is pretty well known to have the best the most one-for-one -one testing experience as compared to the real test um but it can get pricey and so there's some of these things depending on if you're doing an individual license or partnering with a firm that you might be working with, uh, can be can be valuable to review. Um, even if you is if your firm is considering offering assistance in maybe getting uh, a license to one of these resources, absolutely share this information with them so that you can have um, a collective research and decision. Uh, I, I, I know that they also allow. Um, memberships for self-formed groups. So yes. you were mentioning that you've got friends in Chicago and whatnot. All of you guys go in for a period of six months and buy a six-month pass and and get access that way to to your group um, is another way to to approach it with yeah. black practicals. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And then I wanted to specifically point out. I think it was back on this first page. Where are those Hannah Hand lectures? Oh, Schiff. It used to be Schiff Harden. Schiff Harden is where he used to work. His name is Michael Hanahan, and he works as he's a professor at um, Chicago, Illinois University. Um, where did I, we put those? Are you on good on the ARE study materials, not the third party resources? Oh, yeah, you're probably right. Got contract samples here. Sorry, we'll, we'll find this before we leave. It's a great guide um, uh, series. If you here think. we go. Yeah, so he, right. So yeah, he's a he's at Perkins Co. now, uh, but his name is Michael Hanahan, and it's essentially it's a professional practice course that he teaches at in Chicago. Um, but if you go to this page uh, at his current law firm, so he's a he's a construction lawyer. Um, he he knows the practice well. So if you go to and he'll he'll constantly update these with every semester that he teaches it. He'll give fresh audio files and presentation slides. 
so it's it's going to feel like a podcast and you know it's it's straight out of his class lecture but he has slides to go with it the audio file i know personally i and you're not gonna you don't have to go through every single one of these lectures but it might be like you know definitely make sure you hit the b101 definitely make sure you hit the a201 and um let's see maybe just general licensing of architects and hey, you're certainly welcome to hit all of this if you find it a valuable resource but mm -hmm. i know those those ones are the important ones to hit and um i know personally i took those sample pdfs of the contracts i printed those off and i just had those in front of me as i was listening to these lectures taking notes highlighting things in the contracts and he essentially goes it can be a little dry he essentially goes through these contracts line by line but he will also explain the intent of it which is important how who and why it protects for each section of a contract and he'll often go on to say uh you know this is in the contract but it's not enforceable uh, <laughs> so it's, it's interesting to get his perspective too on like you know these are constant contracts that are used but uh it might might still not be an enforceable portion of the contract uh, by his opinion, like, granted, it's it's dependent on the court that would review it in a legal situation. But uh, it's an interesting perspective, and he's a he's a fantastic teacher uh, to understand those contracts better. Yeah, I'll check that out. So, yeah, that was a uh, the Schiff Hardin lectures is what we have it listed as. Okay, totally free. Um, going back to if there's anything else, so. Um, if there's anything on there that you need that says that AIA Cincinnati has it, um, you know, reach out to Julie, reach out to one of us, and we'll we'll help you getting a copy of some of that stuff. We are working with AIA Ohio in setting up a digital resource library that you can check out, like uh, what it might work for, like an audiobook from your local library. We're we're still working through the process of how that's getting licensed through all the state's jurisdictions, but uh, that is a something that we plan to launch by the end of the year, I hope. Um, so it, it's not the quickest thing, but it, it should be a pretty well-established resource when we get it up and running. That um, sounds exciting. Yeah, and then you know, following this one, we've done most of these sessions so far on the general exams. I think we've got to double back to um, so project management and programming and analysis. And so those will be on the AIA Cincinnati's event calendar. So this one was today. We do this last Saturday of every month. And what's our next one? Our next one is project management. So that's coming up on August 26th. Uh, and feel free to sign up for that one as well if you're interested. But also, you might be interested in just looking at AIA Cincinnati's general events. I know uh, we'll be hosting in my office next Tuesday a permitting 101 with a senior plans examiner from the city of Cincinnati to just go over everything top to bottom of what goes into the permitting process from a pretty high level perspective, definitely focused on more of uh, younger designers or people maybe not, maybe not as familiar in that permitting process. So that's gonna be a bit of a networking meet and greet and then sort of discussion we've got oh unfortunately that's sold out but it was a movie screening at the contemporary art center with the zaha hadid uh, and we've got a number of things uh every week that you're welcome to check out uh, and join and do a little bit of networking or might just be get some drinks and meet some people so i think this one specifically we're um we're partnering with seaoo which is a structural engineering association so kind of cross, crossing the wires there with other people in the industry should be interesting. What? We just, <laughs> architects can only mingle with other architects. We can't. Right, right. I we fear, can't go mingle. I fear others. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we've got all sorts of resources uh, that you're always welcome to. And if you're, if you ever have a question about anything, feel free to reach out, uh, even if it's just... A little bit of guidance or if you want to if you want to gripe about NCARB that's totally reasonable too 
<laughs> uh, so just reach out if you need anything. All right. Well, thank you again. This was great. Yeah, thank you. And uh, thanks for joining us. You certainly had a rough road so far. And anything that, that Brian and I or, or uh, Darian can do to help make your the rest of your journey easier. Um, yeah, we're definitely here to help you out. And good luck with it. I appreciate it. Thanks Absolutely. so much. All right. Thank you. All right. You all have a great weekend. Thanks. Thank you you too. Bye. Bye.